And joining us now, the former Chief of Defense Staff, General Rick Hillier, now retired. He's got a new book out called A Soldier First, Bullets, Bureaucrats, and the Politics of War. And as I welcome you to the studio, I must confess I was a little surprised at the subtitle. Because knowing your no-nonsense ways, I thought for sure it would have been bullets, bureaucrats, and bull something you can't say on TV. <laughs> Did you think about that? No, I didn't, actually. And the subtitle was a, a combination of a little discussion I had with our oldest son, Chris. And uh, he had heard me talk about a variety of things and that I would be talking about in the book. He said, here's, here's a topic, Dad. Here's a topic. And so he rhymed it off. I said, you know something that rings, it resonates, and I think I'm going to use it. And in fact, we did. I want to read uh, an excerpt from the book to start with, then play a little tape, and then come back at you with my first question. Here's the excerpt. In the backwards-looking, bureaucratic, cumbersome, and risk-averse Canadian forces that we had become, no one encouraged the ability to work as one organization, and any suggestion of strategic change was fought tooth and nail by almost all concerned. There was, therefore, much nervousness in military circles at the prospect that I would be chosen as the new chief, a position that some presumed I would use to promote only the land component of the Canadian forces. There was also some nervousness elsewhere that I would be impossible to control, if appointed as the senior military officer in Canada. And speaking of impossible to control, I'm going to ask our viewers to think about when the last time was that they heard a military man in this country speak like this. Roll tape. These are detestable murderers and scumbags. I'll tell you that right up front here. We are the Canadian Forces, and our job is to be able to kill people. That plain-spokenness, scumbags, for example, was the impossible to control concern that you even expressed yourself warranted? Oh, not at all, not at all. I was describing people who were killing our young Canadian soldiers, Canada's sons and daughters, who were murdering and brutalizing and torturing Afghan civilians, women, men, children. And, and really, I, I spoke what I, I believed about them, what I thought about them. I make no apologies for that. I don't think that was any evidence of being difficult to control at all. I simply called it like I saw it, and I think actually based on what I felt across the country after that, Canadians said, yeah, that's exactly what they are. They may very well have said that, but of course you were kind of flying in the face of a, you know, of a, of a presumed reputation that we have as a bunch of nice peacekeepers as opposed to people who go out there and kill people for a living. You that's, wanted to do that, right? No, but that was a presumed reputation. Right. In the Canadian forces, there's always been a huge frustration that we were always labeled peacekeepers. And our guys used to, and gals, and girls and gals and guys used to say, you know, hey, sir, we're soldiers. We can do the full spectrum of operations for our country whenever we need to do it. And being labeled a peacekeeper takes the spectrum from here down to there. And then not only to be labeled a peacekeeper, but to be put in places on missions where actually there was no peace to keep, then was a misuse of those men and women. So it was a great frustration, a very frustrating term for the people in uniform themselves. And in fact, I thought it was uh, the wrong term to describe the Canadian forces who actually train to manage violence on, the, on behalf of the people of Canada when it's needed. Let me take you back. <clears throat> you maintain that growing up in Newfoundland made you a good soldier. How come? I think so too. I think the characteristics of Newfoundlanders and, and Maritimers in general, and I don't, I don't dis, uh, disregard the characteristics of the other parts of the country, but growing up in Newfoundland, it was very independent. It was a very tough environment, uh, and you know, so you were out in the uh, rough weather, uh, you were out in the woods, uh, you were out fishing, you were out in boat, you were using uh, vehicles and equipments, using weapons from time to time, and you were doing that in terrible weather. Of course, Newfoundland is renowned for that. And so if you had ever stopped doing something because the weather was bad or you were cold and you were wet, then you actually would have done not very much in life. <laughs> and I think all those characteristics really help you become a soldier and endure the kind of difficulties that you often face, just normal difficulties. And then I think Newfoundlanders really have developed a sense of humor to help them handle those kinds of things and a sense of humor I have found in the past and continue to find during, particularly during stressful times, is one of the best de-stressors that you can possibly have. And, and, and lastly, Newfoundlanders are a very close society, very close communities, many of them isolated, and so they, they, they interact very closely, very personable, and I think the, the personality and the ability to be able to deal with people and be relaxed amongst people of every rank or, or, or st uh, station in society, I think that really is helpful as a leader in trying to become a soldier and all those good things that we do. I must tell you, one of the things that, that um, impressed slash surprised me when I read the chapter dealing with how you got hired in the first place by Paul Martin, it seemed almost as if you were giving him a job interview as much as he was giving you a job interview. You said to him, I'm open to taking the job, but only on the following conditions. And if you don't meet my conditions, I'm not interested in the job. Why did you do that? Oh, absolutely. 
uh, I had no interest in working for the Prime Minister of Canada and the Government of Canada as a Chief of Defence Staff if they were on the one hand asking for change in the Canadian Forces, but if that change was not what I, you know, also uh, saw as necessary. And that change being? Uh, well, to transform the Canadian Forces, to bring that Army, Navy, Air Force together, to make us work as one team, to allow us to, to be deployed on missions as one component as opposed to separate components all over the place to give us the profile and the credibility and therefore the influence uh, worldwide that I believe we had to have. And then not only that, to transform us in the way we did our business tactically so that we could be ready to address the challenges and threats that we see in the world now. Not a Cold War type of threat, but, but to the point. Did you worry that it was a little cocky though to say to the Prime Minister, you know, maybe uh, I'll consider it if you meet my conditions? Not at all. No? Not at all. I wasn't interested in taking the job and carrying the entire onus and responsibility for changing the Canadian forces with no support from political leaders, with no money and with no political decisions made. It was simply impossible to do and I would be taking a job that would be doomed to failure and I wasn't going to take the job. I don't think it was cocky. I think it was just downright right, good pragmatism and Prime Minister Martin, God bless his heart, responded magnificently and like every good politician he said, well we don't have much money this year and we don't have much next in the year after but you know out there in year four or five or six and you know Prime Minister that's not quite good enough. <laughs> if we're going to start the changes we're going to need some money up front and we're going to need those political decisions and he delivered. I'm surprised the fit again was was so good with Paul Martin and the Liberals because the Liberals for many years had espoused soft power and you have a great quote in the book about your doubts about using soft power in a hard world. How, uh, how did you get, how did you convince them that enough about the soft power, we, we need to be into hard power too? Well I don't think I had to convince them. Uh, Prime Minister Martin had said to me right at the start of our discussions that he really valued the Canadian forces he knew it needed some help. He wanted to help rebuild it, but he wanted to change it as that rebuilding was taking place. And so he was already there. He understood that there is a combination of uh, things that you do when you're a, a G8 nation uh, and you're operating on the international scene, and he wanted to be a part of it. I never had to convince folks of that. Uh, that was already there, and we simply needed to rebuild the capabilities that had started to disappear long ago, and, and in some cases either had disappeared or, or were close to it. Let me ask you about the Canadian predilection for constantly referring to our values in international arenas rather than our national interests, which is what most countries do. What's wrong with the way we have traditionally done it, which is to talk values rather than interests? Well, first of all, it, it often in the past, I think, confused what we were trying to do in a specific area of the world. And yes, I'm, I think actually the best combination is to be able to articulate national interests and whether we seek security and stability or democracy or inclusive of democracy in a place and then couple that with our values of trying to help people who need help of helping uh, you know, uh, each segment of a society be equal to the other, let's say women in a place like Afghanistan. And so to couple both national interests, which guide a nation's operations anywhere around the world, and then the values allow you to conduct those operations in a certain manner. But we don't talk much about that. No, we don't. And I think that's a failing of our country. I don't think we've had that geopolitical discussion, that strategic discussion. I don't think we have the think tanks around our country that help us get to those discussions. And therefore, you don't see it in a political dynamic. And and now, and unfortunately over this last four or five years, when you're in a minority parliament all the time, you are in constant election mode. It's a campaign mode in Ottawa every single day. Yep. The furthest anybody looks out is next week or next month, whenever the possible election is, and all they're thinking about are the decisions that will either win them or cost them votes a week from now or a month from now, and you simply can't have those kind of geostrategic long-range discussions for our country. I think they're absolutely necessary, and I'd love to see more of it in Canada. Another excerpt from the book. As commander of ISAF, that's the forces in Afghanistan, I did not turn to Canada <clears throat> as my go-to nation when I wanted a job done because of the complex and cumbersome system in Ottawa and bureaucratic approach to operations. When we had missions that had to happen quickly, I went to my British contingent. I went to the Norwegian company and occasionally I went to the French battle group. Very seldom did I go to Canada. The time, detail, pain and agony to get something done and the hand-wringing over it were so extensive that I concluded it just wasn't worthwhile. Can you give me a for instance on that? Sure. Uh, in fact, there were many. And as a commander, you know, you, you give the, those opportunities one or two chances to succeed, and then you go look elsewhere for the success that you need. So you get two or three people that you've identified through a variety of intelligence sources as being uh, terrorists, planning an attack and preparing for an attack in the middle of a city like Kabul. Uh, you've narrowed them down to a compound. 
uh, that's maybe in an area of 500 meters by 500 meters, and you know they're going to be there two, three, maximum four hours. You need to be able to conduct operations with the, with the Afghan National Security Forces, and you need to be able to do it right now in two hours, three hours or more. When I went to Canada and asked for that kind of response, the contingent commander in Kabul would have to go back to Ottawa for permission, uh, much consideration All of the demand. It's a combination of National Defense Headquarters and then the government bureaucracy itself because many people played in what the Canadian forces were doing overseas. Defense Minister as well? Uh, usually not for that, for that kind of thing. It usually would be at the bureaucratic level. Mm -hmm. and, and then they would consider it, ask questions, seek a huge amount of def detail in order to give the comfort back in Ottawa, that yes, the thing was right and all those good things, as opposed to relying upon the commander on the ground to do that assessment, which is why he was there in my view, and 12 to 72 hours later, come back with a response, either yes or no. Mm -hmm. By then it was too late. After the first or second time, I started going to the British, I started going to the Norwegians, and both countries responded very quickly whenever we needed them. So what did they do and right that, that our folks weren't figuring out? Well, what they did was set a commander up on the ground. They gave that commander the mission, the guiding parameters, uh, the, the resources, the people, the equipment to do the job, well trained with the leadership on the ground. And then they wanted to simply be kept in the loop for information so there were no surprises. Up to a certain level of operations, they let him or her as the commander execute without their sort of having to, mm. to approve it. Too much cover your butt in this country? <clears throat> well, what it was, and somebody described it to me as this, is trying to look at Afghanistan from Ottawa with a 12,000 kilometer straw and try and tinker with the mission with a 12,000 kilometer screwdriver. You simply can't do that. I had a long discussion with Pat Stogren, who commanded our first battle group in 2002 uh, in, in, in Kandahar. And uh, when Pat came home, I sat down and said, Pat, you know, okay, now what are the lessons learned here? Uh, what have we learned? What, what were the good things and bad things? And Pat said, sir, the command structure just simply will not work. In flexible, fast-changing operations where the threat is high, you've got to be flexible. You've got to be, you have to be agile, and otherwise you are not going to be able to take the enemy off balance. And he said, the way it works right now simply is not going to do the job. And I just took those lessons to, uh, to myself, and, uh, and we made some changes when I became Did chief you, do defense. You think, do you think you had positive change in that area? Absolutely. I used to say to the commanders after we had given them some pretty tailed detailed discussions and guidance and briefings on what their missions were. And I say, you know, now you've got it all, right? You've got my guidance. We have our mission clear. You have my guidance. You have the parameters in which you can work. You have the best young men and the women, uh, young, best young men and women in the world executing the mission for, we, for you. We have the best equipment that I can give you. And if you need something else, we'll get it for you. Now go do your job. And if I have to do your job, I want your salary too, because uh, I'll be doing your job and nobody ever offered that up. So they went and did their job. What those commanders did was just rise to the occasion. And guys like Gila Rush and Dave Fraser and Tim Grant and those others were just incredible Canadians. They didn't need me looking over their shoulder for every little tactical operation. Okay. Let's talk money. It's, it's interesting how right now we find ourselves, in terms of uh, financial history, uh, very much as if we were back in the mid-1990s. You became CDS at a pretty good time insofar as the government of the day was prepared to spend money to catch up for what you called, I guess, the lost decade. Uh, the books were balanced then. They are way out of balance today, $55.9 billion and counting is the annual deficit. Do you anticipate that the military is going to go through another round of extreme belt tightening as we try to get that balance, that budget balanced again? If we go, I don't know. Do I have concerns that uh, there will be a tendency to start doing that? Yes, I do. What I would say to you is this. We went through not the lost decade, it's what I call the decade of darkness. And I, and I use that description to articulate all the challenges that we had and simply to say it was going to take the, the damage was so deep that we were still assessing it, and we believe it was going to take us 20 years to recover. If we go through another significant round of cuts to the Department of National Defense, and most specifically the Canadian Forces, we will be, we'll be very lucky if we don't break the Canadian Forces. The and, what does that mean? Well, that we'll end up reducing the Armed Forces and their capabilities to do operations to the point that all they'll be able to do is administer themselves, and they won't be able to project themselves either across Canada or across the world to help do what Canada actually wants them to do. And that's pretty close to where we got back in the 90s. And, it, and, and because we didn't, but we didn't because we carried so much of that burden on the backs of individual soldiers and sailors and airmen and airwomen who went across the world, across our country time after time after time, as we were getting rid of others, getting rid of equipment, closing bases, and still ramping up those operations. I would be very worried if we went through serious cuts in Department of National Defense that we might end up breaking the Canadian forces. And I would obviously recommend against that. A G8 nation needs a healthy armed forces, and ours are not yet healthy. 
Your relationship with politicians. Again, one of the surprises, I guess, for me in this book was that you say you got along pretty well with all of the ministers of defense you had to deal with, Bill Graham, Gordon O'Connor, Peter McKay. But at one point, O'Connor, the conservative, said, they want to see less of you out there. Yes, he did. What did you infer from that? Well, I inferred that uh, some of the staffers at uh, the PMO, the Prime Minister's office, had been talking to him, and they resented the fact that either I was being covered in the print media, on television, or on the radio, and I was out there too much for their liking for whatever reason. And Gord said that to me. He and I sat in the office. Uh, we had a coffee together, and we were chatting. He said, you know, we need to see less of you. And I knew where the message had come from right away. There was no doubt in my mind. And he's a former military man. Yes, he is. And he would have understood, presumably, as a former military man, that you were out there you know, promoting the goodwill of the troops, and that would be a good thing. I think he did understand that, but he also came from a different era where the Canadian forces and the military men uh, ran away from the microphones and TV cameras to a certain extent, and I think he was from that era somewhat. But Gord, you know, and I had a, had a conversation about this, and, and he told me that twice, and twice I said, you know, Minister, I cannot do my job that way. We're trying to restore our connection to Canadians across the nation. We, uh, we had lost it really since World War II. We're trying to restore the pride of people in uniform that they are professional soldiers and sailors, airmen and airwomen. And we had lost, I believe, a lot of that pride in Canada that it was good to be a Canadian soldier. And I said, I simply cannot do my job like that. He went through the thing the second time. I said, you know, Minister, I can't do my job that way. And we left it there, and I never heard about it anymore from him. No after pushback that. after that? None whatsoever. And uh, Gordon and I got along well most of the time. We had a few rocky moments, but as I said several times in the book, we both agreed that we agreed on more things than we had money to spend, and we got after those things. And Gord should get some compliments true, and I, and I do write this in the book also. He delivered. Uh, you know, he worked hard, and he got his nose to the grindstone, and he delivered. C-17 aircraft, Leopard 2 tank, go on and on and on. He delivered. God bless him. I think he said, though, he doesn't intend to read the book. And that's his choice. That's his choice. Doesn't bother you? Not at all. As long as 35 million Canadians, other Canadians read it, I'll be a happy <laughs> no, camper. Okay, okay. That's his choice. Interesting as well. You call him Gord. You yep. don't call him Minister O'Connor, which is what, that's, that's how they talk in Ottawa. Yeah, I know. And that's Ottawa speak. And Ottawa is a bit of a closed bubble, a closed circuit, if you will. Uh, no, you know, he, uh, he was acquaintance of uh, long standing. I worked for him. He was my commanding officer back in 1979 Absolutely. and, in fact, promoted me to captain. Were you on a first name basis with him then? Uh, no, certainly not. I called him Sir then. I was a lowly lieutenant. Okay, so how can and he you call was a him by his first officer. name now? Because I think we transcended the rank and structure of, uh, of the relationship. And You and called him that the... when he was minister? No, I did not. I would never address our minister okay. by a first name. I think there's a, a term of respect and an appropriate uh, address to each other. Okay. Afghanistan, <clears throat> then and now. Again, another ex excerpt from your book. Most of us thought that the war in Afghanistan was going to be over quickly. The Taliban had crumbled, the new government had been formed under the Bonn Accord, and it seemed simply a matter of carrying out the last few operations to clear the remnants of the Taliban and Al-Qaeda. And maybe, just maybe, everyone was quietly crossing their fingers over this one. Get the opportunity, lay hands on Osama bin Laden himself. The expectation in 2002 was that Afghanistan was going to be largely wrapped up by the summer. It didn't quite work out that way. Here's my first of a few questions on Afghanistan. If you knew that our involvement in that war was going to cost the lives of more than 100 of our finest young men and women, would you still have advocated participating? You know, I don't think you can make decisions based upon looking forward and say, we're going to take this number of losses, and therefore it's worth it. And if we take this number, it's not. Uh, the loss of every single man or woman, and we've lost two there now in Afghanistan, struck me personally, struck me intensely. Uh, I knew most of those men and women. Uh, I had met almost all of them personally at one time or another. I think you have to separate yourself from that and you have to do two things. One, you have to make sure the mission is worthwhile and right. And that's our government's responsibility, but there is military advice that helps shape that uh, decision to ensure that the mission is right for our country and that we're going to achieve something, we're going to do it in a uniquely Canadian way, and that we're going to actually get some good out of this. And then secondly, the fact that then you're going to do all the things necessary to set conditions for success on the ground and by doing that, reduce the risk to the men and women who execute the mission. I think that's what you have to do as a responsible leadership, political at the top end, and then for doing the mission in the military side uh, in a G8 nation like Canada, which does have responsibilities worldwide. Is this war a war of necessity? I believe absolutely. I believe that Southwest Asia, for example, uh, is an area of uh, huge chaos. And inside that chaos, you do get the extremists who want to take over. So you talked earlier about interest and values. 
you know, were we content just with the values alone that extremists would murder women because they've been seen with a man that's not from their family, that they would whip women whose shoes clicked on the streets when they walked, were we content as Canadians? We who had pushed a responsibility to protect at the United Nations as the lead nation pushing that, mm -hmm. were we content to sit back and say, okay, that's good and we're not going to try and help change that? And at the same time, as they generate huge exodus of people from the country that actually affect Canada because it does cause immigration to Canada. They, they become a hotbed for the development of terrorists and extremists and of course that's going to affect every single country in the world including ours and what you don't want to have is a petri dish there in Afghanistan, Southwest Asia where something like Al-Qaeda or other terrorist groups similar uh, you know grow, recruit, train, project, finance and then send out their uh, uh, there are warriors uh, to attack the West. I think absolutely a war of necessity. And, I mean, you can argue about how it's being executed all you want, but should we be there, I believe fundamentally, yes. It's just that, the, you know, there, there, the conditions that you describe just now exist in other places in the world. And for various reasons, we have chosen <clears throat> not to go to tackle those problems elsewhere. We have chosen to go to tackle those problems in Afghanistan, which is why some say this is a war of choice not necessity. Why do you disagree with that? Well, I disagree with it because we are a G8 nation that is, that is a middle power and based on our decade of darkness we have a limited capability, particularly in the Canadian forces, to do more than one major operation at a time. So if you want to go to all those other places that also need help, none more so than Afghanistan by the way, just based on the values alone, you can go there in small little packets that will indeed have very little of any effect. Well, let me, but this, let me just go back to the interest for a second here though. We're talking about Southwest Asia, Pakistan, which is, I'm not sure if it's the largest uh, uh, population of Muslims in the world, but certainly with, but, uh, yeah, there's, so there must be at least second, so a huge number of Muslims with a large uh, extremist base within that, and sitting in the middle of the Southwest Asia area with three nuclear powers around her, one of which is Pakistan, if it is not in our national interest to help turn the chaos in that area into more stable and secure region, then I don't know what would be. And so therefore, I think it is a war of necessity okay, and go I there first. You. I hear you, but le let me present another conflicting picture if I can. And that is, I don't know if you read Janice Stein and Eugene Lang's book. No, I, I didn't. Okay. I skimmed through parts of it, but I didn't read okay. it. Okay, they, they <clears throat> tell in the book, and I'll get your version of it here. They say in the book that you had a conversation with Paul Martin when he was prime minister. And you said, I need this to do a good job in Afghanistan. And you told him what it was. And then he said, if I give you this, will there be anything left over for Darfur? Because he cared as much, if not more, about Darfur yes, as, he did Paul about Martin did. as he did about Afghanistan. And you said, no problem. You give me this. There's still whatever else you need for Darfur. Turned out not to be the case. Yep. Turned out when he made his ask for Darfur, it wasn't there. Did you mislead him? Uh, in fact, no, I didn't. And here's what I would say to that. Yes, I did say, I believe we'll have the capability also going to Darfur. Two things occurred following that, and the world changes, and, and so not misleading somebody. Number one was, we were still assessing that decade of darkness, and we realize now how we had brutalized the Canadian forces, and how our capabilities to do almost anything had atrophied down to absolutely the minimum. So all of a sudden, we found ourselves in Afghanistan, and we realized that, man, that's one mission, and we probably got the capability to do one mission, and that's if we're wrapped in a huge alliance, which brings all of the other stuff that we don't have uh, none of. Secondly, if you go into Darfur, there's no huge military alliance there. We simply do not have the capability to go and conduct significant operations in a place like Darfur, or indeed any other place, without being wrapped in a military alliance that brings almost all of the things that we should have, perhaps, but don't have. So, okay, misleading is not the word you'd like then. What, no, I would say what, what he had to face was the implications of 10 to 15 years of that decade of darkness that had caused the Canadian forces to fall apart and so that we had the capability only to go be able to go and do one mission. So I had not assessed all of the capabilities of the Canadian forces and we were still doing that the day I left the Chief of Defence Staff's job. That's why I gave that speech where I called it the decade of darkness that it's going to take us 20 years to recover. Hmm. Where are we in that 20-year period right now? Well, we're at about year six. Year six. So That's right. To go. You also reveal in the book that Canadians are not as supportive of, of this war as they might be because politicians of all stripes <clears throat> haven't adequately explained why we're there. How can, and of course, when you go out and make the speeches and explain why we're there, you say you get an immediate uptick in popular uh, backing for, for that position. How is it that eight years later, we still have political leadership in this country that can't adequately explain to Canadians why we're there? 
Steve, you're talking to the wrong guy, asking the question to the wrong guy. But you must have I'm a not a politician. Hear, I'm not going not to be yet, a politician. Anyway. And I'm not, not yet. going to be a politician. For sure? Uh, for sure. And so you need to ask the political leaders that. All I know is this. When I go around the country this uh, last five years, but actually since I've become a civilian, since I retired from the Canadian Forces this last year and a quarter, I've spoken to tens of thousands of Canadians about leadership, about inspirational things of our great young men and women in uniform and their families. And I talk a little bit about Afghanistan, and I've heard from those tens of thousands of people is every Canadian should hear this. We want to know more. How come we don't know more? Where's the media on this one? And why don't we get the stories out there? And so I simply say, I hear it all the time, but maybe people should ask their political leaders. You know what? Uh, I'll, I'll tell you this for what it's worth. Uh, obviously, as a public broadcaster, we feel an obligation as a public service to focus on Afghanistan, you know, a significant amount. Time in and time out, they are almost always our lowest rated programs. Yep. Uh, why do you think that is? I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I watch some of the programs on Afghanistan. I certainly don't watch them all, but maybe it is because they haven't gotten into the heart, felt the, the grit of the sand in their teeth, if you will. Now, let me give you uh, an example of why I say that. The last year I was chief of defense staff. I went into Kandahar Airfield and then jumped out to where our troops were, almost all of whom are deployed into, into Taliban country. I came back several days later at a little media scrum with, I think, six or seven uh, media representatives, journalists, one TV camera. They asked all their questions. I finally said, okay, we're finished now, right? I said, yeah, it's okay. Turn your cameras, your microphones off, and we had a little conversation. I said, how many of you have gone outside the wire of Kandahar Airfield, which is really a, a, a small city? And one person out of the six or seven put their hand up, and they all said their editors won't let them go. The home station is afraid to let them go out. Their insurance companies won't let them go out. As a result, they stay inside. And as a result, they report one tiny part of the mission from inside Kandahar Airfield, mm. and that doesn't excite anybody. They need to go and report. They need to be with the Afghans. And occasionally, journalists are going to have to put themselves at risk, as some have done. Some mm. great reporting has come from there. Chris Waddy, uh, I watched Christy Blatchford, Don Martin, and mm. others, and others who do magnificent work and have gotten themselves way out there for a long period of time. Let me ask you about Hamid Karzai. Yeah. Friend of yours? You want to go that far? I mean, you had a good uh, relationship with you him. You know, I had a good way. relationship with him. I'd leave him to describe whether it was a, okay. a, a friend or not. Is he a reliable partner for peace? I thought he was. This is back in 2004. I saw him many times since, but I have not seen him for the last year and a half or a year and you three quarters. you think he still is a good partner for peace? Uh, that's hard to define. I think right now he still brings uh, some synergy between the international community and the various parts of the Afghan population, the tribes themselves. And I think he, he's got the toughest job in the world, this guy. It's almost, uh, uh, there's a little too much corruption around him too, from what you but, hear. But you know, some, there is uh, corruption around him, and there is corruption around the government, per se, is what I, what I actually uh, would focus on. And I would say this, we criticize the government all the time. We criticize President Karzai and his government because they're not effective enough, they're not delivering enough for their people, and yeah, there is some corruption around it, without question. Uh, and, and that's all right and appropriate, and we should push the Afghans to deliver all that kind of stuff even faster and better and more effective than they are right now, because they can improve a lot. But my second part would be, so, okay, we criticize them all the time. What are we doing to help them? President Karzai, the first time I met him, said, look, our greatest threat in Afghanistan is not the Taliban. It's our own lack of capacity to do things for ourselves, to run our own country. And he said to me, the folks who used to know how to run a government in Afghanistan, after 25 years of war, they're all dead or living in the West. Hmm. So what are we back in Canada, as one example, throwing rocks at Ahmed Karzai and his government every single day, what are we doing to help him improve the process, reduce the corruption, deliver basic education, deliver basic medical care to the people of Afghanistan, and convince them that the democratic political process is the way ahead, not the way of the Taliban with the Kalashnikov. Let me ask you about something that is extremely topical these days, and that is the decision that President Obama has to make as to whether or not to accept the recommendation from his general over there, Stanley McChrystal, for another 40,000 troops. I guess the, the short form is, do we double down or do we do something else? What would you recommend? Well, first of all, Stan McChrystal, uh, God bless him for being the blunt, frankly speaking, commander that he is. Uh, you know, out of all the commanders around who have run the mission in Afghanistan, there must be at least a dozen. Uh, Stan is one of the one or two or three that actually gets it. He's got that mission. He understands it. He knows what you have to do. And, and protecting the people is, is very much, as, and that's absolutely right. That's Not very killing much them with friendly fire, too. Well, absolutely, yeah. although sometimes things get blown out of proportion on that, yeah. too. Uh, sometimes, you're, you, you know, things occur and people die, and that is tragic, and you learn lessons from it and carry on. 
Stan knows what is needed. So he has said, look, here are some options. If we do this on the one end, I believe we can set conditions for success in the longer term that are overwhelming. If we don't do this, here are some other options which will make it more difficult and make the risks greater. What he has said, we need security forces, 40,000. The Obama administration is considering this. They're meeting their responsibilities. My assessment, the Obama administration will probably say, okay, we'll kick in 25,000 or 20,000, and we're after NATO countries to kick in the rest and move some forces down to the south where we actually need them. But Stan has also said he needs a lot of help building that government, and the Obama administration is already focused with his support on helping Pakistan because uh, I believe that there are three priorities. I once told John Negroponte out of the White House, if I had three priorities in Afghanistan, it would be Pakistan, Pakistan, Pakistan. Mm. Up till a year ago, Pakistan did not believe the Taliban were a major threat to their society. They looked at India as the major threat to Pakistan. Last six to 12 months, they've now changed completely. They realized the Taliban threatened the very fabric of their society and their country, and they're now starting to do something about it. And the United States and the rest of the international community has got to do, help them do that, because if the Pakistanis can neutralize to a large extent the Taliban and particularly their leadership on the northwest provinces, the game in Afghanistan becomes so much easier to win because they'll no longer have a refuge. Their commanders won't be able to hide there, recruit there, plan there, and then sally across the border to attack our troops. And then we'll be able to grow the Afghan security forces, maybe help out on the government in, in Kabul and, and get that mission successful and to the point where we want it. Okay, in our last couple of minutes, let, let me ask you about one more thing. And that is, if President Obama were to come to whoever the Prime Minister is in 2011 and say, I need you to stay. We need you to have a combat role in this country past the deadline that your parliament has already put in place. What should we say? Well, between now and 2011, there's a lot of water to go under the bridge. I do think, as I said earlier, that we need to have a strategic discussion in this country about what our role in the world is and what we're going to do, and then how, what our role in Afghanistan is and how we're going to do that role. I'll, I'll say just a couple things. One, we should be under no false impressions that the mission will be over. In 2011, there will still will be a security threat that the Afghan forces still will not be grown enough to meet. The Afghan army spokesman said they hope to be able to carry all security tasks by 2013. I think that's overly optimistic myself, but their intentions are absolutely good. Uh, so the mission will not be finished. If Canadian troops leave, somebody else will have to replace them. If Canadian, when Canadian troops leave Afghanistan, no matter if it's 2011 or some other time, they can walk out with their head held high. They've done an incredible job. They've restored Canadian credibility on the international scene. But you'd scene. like them to stay, I'm guessing. Well, I'm not, I'm not saying there, because there are a whole variety of circumstances that have to take place before I can answer a question like that. And I think that's why we need to have that strategic discussion in conjunction with NATO, by the way. They just said, yeah, we agree with the 40,000 troops here. Okay, let's see what the other countries of NATO are going to do okay, but as part of that agreement. Uh, uh, listen, I don't know you that well, but if you say the mission isn't over by 2011, I can't imagine you would agree with the notion of our troops leaving before the job is done. Well, but also even uh, it, I would not agree with them staying unless certain other things have been put in place. And like I say, we need to have a discussion. We need to have a discussion with NATO, see what the Obama administration is going to support on the, on the things that Stan McChrystal has asked for, and then take it from there one step at a time. Ideally, not in the ever-present election campaign mode that exists in Ottawa, because hmm. that's when it will go off tracks if you have the discussion then. You did say in the book that uh, certainly the Liberals asked you pretty hard to run. Are, you're saying, hey, look, are the you the night I door? announced my retirement, I went over to up. the CTV, I think it was 50th anniversary uh, reception, and I got pinged on by three le Liberal members of the caucus saying, you know, if you're going to run, we want you to run for us and come see us. Why don't you? Uh, I'm not interested, thank you very much. I don't want to be a part of a parliament that operates in the way it does right now. I don't think that the opportunity to achieve something in our country as a parliamentarian, as a political leader, uh, is equal to what it would cost you and your family to engage in public life. And I see my life going very differently in a whole variety of ways. You I, want to do be not defense, intend, I do not intend on becoming a, a politician or a political leader. If elected, you will not serve if... You know, I keep saying I'm not going to run. I actually mean that. And everybody keeps asking me, and it seems I don't protest well, too much. Beca well, because you wouldn't be the first guy to change your mind. You're allowed to change your mind in this world. But I'm not on this one. <laughs> okay. General Hillier, it's really good of you to spend so much time with us today. The book's called A Soldier First, Bullets, Bureaucrats, and the Politics of War. Thanks so much for visiting us at TVO tonight. Steve, my pleasure. Thank you. Thank you.